Hello and uh, a very warm welcome to our service today. Now the theme of today's service is the umbrella of God's mercy. It's a phrase I came across earlier this week in something that I was reading and I really liked it. So like so many preachers I decided I would uh, borrow it. Now it may seem a strange phrase as umbrellas are usually meant to keep something out, usually rain or in the summer bright sunshine. And we'll be looking at the idea of an umbrella this time that encompasses and brings everything under its protection, that leaves no one out in the rain. But let's pause as we worship together and gather under the umbrella of God's mercy. Let us pray. Let the door of our hearts be open to receive, O Christ, the soul of our being unlocked to welcome you and the gate of our life flung wide for your entering in. Amen. Let's sing together our opening hymn, My Song is Love Unknown. And thank you to Robert Main for uh, accompanying us in two of the hymns today. So over to you. Thank you, Robert.
Isaiah chapter 56, verse 1, and then verse 6 to 8. The title reads, God's people will include all nations. The Lord says to his people, do what is just and right, for soon I will save you. And the Lord says to those foreigners who become part of his people, who love him and serve him, who observe the Sabbath and faithfully keep his covenant, I will bring you to Zion, my sacred hill, and give you joy in my house of prayer, and accept the sacrifices you offer on my altar. My temple will be called a house of prayer for the people of all nations. The Sovereign Lord, who has brought his people Israel home from exile, has promised that he will bring still other people to join them. Amen. Matthew chapter 15 verses 21 to 28 The faith of a Canaanite woman And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. I don't know about you, but I'm always shocked when someone does something completely out of character. Now, I remember the first time I saw a film called What Lies Beneath. Now, I warn you, there's a big spoiler coming up for those that haven't seen it. So go make a cup of coffee or, uh, you know, um, uh, turn your head or turn your sound off for a second. Now, Harrison Ford always plays the nice guy or the rogue that turns out to be nice. But in this film, about halfway through, things take a bad turn. And you think, oh, he might be the bad guy in this film. But somehow you still convince yourself that there'll be some twist at the end that exonerates Harrison Ford and all is as it should be. But no, and this is where the spoiler comes in. He actually turns out to be the murderer. I remember sitting with my wife Joanne open-mouthed in the cinema. Now, Joe's a huge Harrison Ford fan, but this was just too much. And I have to say, it's not a film that we've watched again. Too much trauma. Harrison Ford is always the good guy, isn't he? And this is what seems to be happening in today's Gospel reading. 
Jesus is always the good guy, of course. But he seems to be acting out of character. And, well, that can be a little unsettling. On a quick reading, what we see is a rather harsh Jesus. Firstly, ignoring a woman in dire need of his help. The disciples ask for Jesus' permission to send away this annoying, loud and demanding woman. Then we see Jesus even justifying his response from scripture. He then, after a little bit of banter with the woman, refers to her people, and thus her, as dogs. Now this is simply not the Jesus we're used to. What's going on here? What is the point of this story in the Gospels? Let's look a little closer, lift the bonnet of the car as it were, and see if we can get to the problem. Firstly, what we can establish is that Jesus had just moved out of his own country of Israel, Judea, and into a foreign territory, Tyre and Sidon. Gentile territory, not somewhere that Jewish people travel to often, as they were considered places that uh, would open one up to being corrupted, or so they thought at the time. Whilst walking through the region, they were essentially hounded by a local woman, a Canaanite woman, a heathen as far as any good Jewish person of the time was concerned. Her words are actually quite striking though. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Here was a Gentile, foreign woman, recognising Jesus for who he was. She calls Jesus both Lord and son of David, a recognition of authority, both spiritual and physical. And this from what the Jewish people would consider as an unbeliever? A recognition, I have to say, that seems odd, considering the lack of recognition that Jesus often received in his own country. I wonder whether Jesus was intent on eliciting a response and testing the faith of the woman in the story. It's times like these where we have to use our imaginations a little. With many passages in the Bible, we hear and read the words but we're not provided with the subtle nuances or tone to the words spoken. And so we have to continually build up a picture of the character of individuals. And so it is here with Jesus' response. We often see Jesus bantering with people, whether that be Nicodemus, the disciples, the woman at the well, the Pharisees. There's a sense of real everyday conversation and interaction with Jesus. And therefore, when we read a passage where Jesus, on the face of it, is referring to people as dogs, it's out of character of someone who is at ease with people. The woman in this story is quite simply a woman from another ethnic background than his own. And I suppose this is where the difficulty arises. Is Jesus showing some form of prejudice? I don't think so. Not if he's been consistent to the teaching he's been carrying out throughout his whole ministry. That would simply be counterproductive. When reading the Bible, we do have to read it as a whole. When things seem out of place, sometimes we need to work a little harder and not simply be too literal with our reading of the text. So let's add a little nuance to the story based upon what we know of Jesus from our experience of him and the application of his teachings throughout Christian tradition. And let's add to this a little common sense and personal experience of our own faith. Here we see Jesus perhaps with a twinkle in his eye, talking with a woman that because of her ethnicity, as we've said, would be despised by Jesus' own people. Just take talking with her would be considered wrong. Hence the appearance of the initial cold shoulder towards her. But the reality is Jesus does engage with her. He recognises that she knows and respects him more than many of his own people. He uses a derogatory term, not from himself, I suspect, but to reiterate the way in which others saw her and her people, perhaps to see what her response was. Would she perhaps respond in kind? But the woman was not to be dissuaded from her mission. She replies, and I have to say somewhat wittily, that even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I've always suspected that at this point, a smile comes across Jesus' face. 
impressed by this woman who has more understanding of his nature than many from his own country, even his disciples. Yes, Jesus' mission was first to the Jewish nation, the fulfilment of centuries of prophecy. The salvation would come to the world through the son of David, but that salvation was ultimately to the whole of God's creation, no exceptions. There was a plan, and that plan had a direction, God's direction, and Jesus was on a trajectory that led to Jerusalem. He could not and would not be diverted down any other route because of his love for creation. But whenever Jesus came across those in need, he would still be the servant king to them. The woman was praised for her faith and her daughter was healed. Who do we consider outsiders? What is our own prejudice? We all have prejudices. We can't help it. These can be subtle. We can even self-justify our prejudices through our cleverness, through our intellect, through our upbringing, even through biblical study. After all, the reason the Jewish community 2,000 years ago believed salvation was for them alone was because of their study of scripture. Now, some words from the opening hymn today stick with me. They say this, Yet cheerful he to suffering goes, that he his foes from thence might free. As I often say, Jesus died for all of humanity. He died for those that hated him, those that reviled him, those that murdered him. He died for those that did not know him, that were in every way different from him, because there was no prejudice in him. There's no prejudice on the cross. There's no prejudice in the resurrection. Jesus would have been expected to discard the woman who demanded so much of him. And yet he, like the God he is, saw her as his own and healed her daughter as his own, as she requested. I think the message of this passage is for those that consider themselves outsiders. That think that they are unloved, unwanted, perhaps because of their appearance or ethnicity or sexuality or status or wealth or lack of wealth. The list of why someone becomes an outsider is far too large. But for those of you who consider yourself an outsider, there is always a place amongst God's people for you. To be welcomed by the same Jesus that welcomed the woman in the story. Come as you are. I had a friend once who was reticent about coming into a church because he thought he wasn't good enough. He thought he had to somehow become someone else in order to be allowed in. And that saddened me. Because God made you who you are. He thinks that you are beautiful. And you are welcome. Those words in the intro of the service, the umbrella of God's mercy, sum up today's message for me. We are all welcomed under God's amazing, huge umbrella protecting us and shielding us. I'm sure we've all seen those giant golfing umbrellas. Certainly we see a lot of them in Scotland. Um, they're so big that you can fit so many people under them in a rainstorm. Well, God's umbrella, God's mercy is infinite. And anyone that wishes to can stand under that merciful umbrella. Amen. Let us pray. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity. The earth has yielded its increase. You, O God, have blessed us. May you continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere you. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Shape our lives with generosity and gift. Help us love without judging and with no strings attached. We will enter the kingdom through the door marked grace. Your life, death and resurrection 
our good news. Let your story shape our story and imagination. We will enter the kingdom through the door marked Gospels. You became flesh and moved into the neighbourhood. Shape our lives with vision that can be lived close at hand and not far away. We will enter the kingdom through the door marked local. You have called us friends, shapers into faithful and kind friends for others. We will enter the kingdom through the door marked friendship. We will go through these doors in the power of the Spirit, sharing in the gifts of the Spirit, knowing that Jesus has gone through them first. Amen. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I couldn't resist as we come to the end of our service to find an umbrella. So I'll just twirl an umbrella for us for a moment. Um, Just as we stand together under this umbrella of God's mercy, um, I can't resist something like this. I just want to say thank you as we come to the end of our service to Kathy and John for our readings today, for Irene for helping us and leading us in prayer, and also again to Robert for leading us um, on the organ. Now, this week, when I wrote my pastoral letter, one of the things that uh, I raised was the idea of being thankful. And I just thought, well, we often uh, use this song, this hymn, to begin a service, saying, I will end his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. Well, we're going to use it at the end of the service this week, um, purely because that sense of thanksgiving isn't just something that we sort of do in church. Um, We don't just do for each other. But their sense of thanksgiving is something that we live and take with us wherever we are. So as we finish our service, let's just sing all at the top of our voices um, that we're entering wherever we are. God's courts with thanksgiving in our heart. And we'll sing it through all probably about three times. Okay.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.